Friend, if you sit there in this pew and you are walking in rejection of Christ, understand that God mourns over you. In Luke chapter 9, verses 41 through 44, we are really picking up right where we left off last week. And in a way, I hate to break these texts up the way that I'm having to, but time only permits us to cover so much ground. And the only reason I say I hate to break these texts up is because we've entered a discourse unit or a portion of Luke's gospel where it's not just individual teachings from Jesus. We're actually walking with Jesus into Jerusalem, and this is a dictation of the events that are unfolding leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection, and then his ascension there in Acts chapter 1, his ascension back into heaven. But we're walking with Jesus. And the truth be told, from last week to this week in the text is really just a matter of hours. It's really just a matter of even minutes, okay? So... The text says in 41, and when he drew near and saw the city. Let's come up to speed here. A couple of weeks ago, we studied about Zacchaeus. Jesus saw him in the sycamore tree there in Jericho. Just prior to that, he had healed a man blind, Bartimaeus, given him sight in the midst of all the people. He travels through Jericho, sees Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree. He comes down. Jesus has lunch or dinner with him at his house. And Zacchaeus is miraculously born again there in the midst of the house. He confesses his sin. He repents. I'll give half my goods to the the poor, I'll remunerate anything I've defrauded from somebody, and I'll give them fourfold what I've taken. And then Jesus teaches the parable of the Minas because the disciples expect that as Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he's going to set up his kingdom, and he corrects their understanding. Jericho is about 19 miles from Bethany and Bethphage, which is where we addressed the text last week. Jesus had come up to Bethany and Bethphage, which is at the base of the Mount of Olives. And to give you a bit of the topography there of Jerusalem, there of the Holy Land, as Jesus comes from Jericho, he comes from the east. I'll do this backwards for you. He comes from the, the east and he travels west to Jericho or from Jericho to the Mount of Olives. As he gets to Bethany and Bethphage at the base of the Mount of Olives, he would have ascended and then descended into the Valley Kidron, into the Kidron Valley, and then ascended back into Jerusalem. At the base of Bethany and Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, that's where Jesus sent two disciples to go and get that donkey, right? Not just any donkey, but the foal of a donkey, holy and lowly, set apart for the Lord. And Jesus has the donkey brought to him, and his disciples start to do something very peculiar. Okay, and there's a magnificent event that takes place. His disciples take their outer garments, they take their, their coats, their outer robes, and they lay those robes on top of that donkey as a saddle for Jesus. And the text says that they picked Jesus, they picked Jesus up and they sat him on the donkey. And then all the multitudes, there was 10,000s of people surrounding Jesus at that point. Just a few weeks prior, he had even raised Lazarus back from the dead. Ten thousands of people surrounding Jesus and the multitudes of disciples took their outer garments, their coats, and they started to lay them on the ground in succession so that not Jesus, but the donkey that Jesus rode would not touch the ground. They were treating Jesus as royalty and they were shouting, Hosanna, which means save us, save us, we pray, help us, you are our salvation. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And this just magnificent triumph, a tremendous amount of momentum as Jesus comes up the Mount of Olives on that donkey, the multitude singing praises to Jesus and praises to God concerning Jesus. Jesus starts to come down the Mount of Olives out into the midst of the Valley Kidron as he looks over that. And from the edge of the Mount of Olives on that descension, he could look out and see almost the entirety of Jerusalem. He could see almost the entirety of the city. And right there on the eastern side of the city, he can see the temple glistening in all of its magnificent glory. The whitewashed stones of the city. No other city like it. No other beauty like it in all of the world. No other temple like it in all of the world as it glistened there in the midday sun when Jesus is descending from the Mount of Olives. And it's at that point that our text picks up. 
And when he drew near and saw the city, you can see it as he comes down the hill and he looks out over the entirety of the city. All of this magnificence, all of this praise, this gigantic worship service that is moving in succession to Jerusalem, praising Jesus. As he drew near and saw the city, he wept. How ironic. He wept. In the midst of the praise of man, ten thousands of voices being raised in glory of Jesus, Jesus wept. There's an infamous passage in Scripture, John chapter 11, verse 35. It's when, the passage when Jesus resurrects Lazarus from the dead. And the way that the passage reads is that Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick unto death, and so he just waited a few days. And he went ahead and just let Lazarus die. And by the time he gets there, they'd say that the body is probably already stinking. Lazarus is dead and his family is mourning and crying for him. And the text says in John chapter 11 verse 35 that Jesus wept. And I wish that our English language would do justice to this. Because you would think that John 11:35 and Luke 19:41 that that's the same word for weep. But in John eleven thirty five, 35, when Jesus' friend Lazarus died, it's the word that's used just for crying. He cried. It's not that deep of a sorrow. Why? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. So he cries just a little because he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. I'm the resurrection and the life. Not the same word. Not the same word at all. The same word of, of this passage, Luke 19, 41, as Jesus looks over Jerusalem and weeps, the same word is used in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. You remember when the wise men refused to come back to Herod and give him reports of where the Christ child was in Bethlehem? They refused to come back, and Herod got ticked off. He got irate. He was furious, and he was so angry that he sent out a decree that all of the babies in Bethlehem be slaughtered. Imagine that. Imagine that if a governor said all of the babies in Mid-County slaughtered, and they went over there to our nursery and confiscated all the kids and killed them. That's what happened in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. And Matthew quotes the prophet Jeremiah who said this. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping. Klaphmas is the word used in both passages. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. That word klauthmas means this type of bewailing, a sobbing, an audible moaning in the weeping. It says that these mothers here in Bethlehem, they wept so loudly. They were mourning and weeping because their babies had been stolen and they had been murdered. And they're so consumed with this intense emotion that they just yell and scream and mourn and weep bitterly. And it says, and they refuse to be comforted because at the same time of being so hurt and distraught, they are so angry that they say, don't touch me. Have you ever been hurt that way? Don't touch me. Don't come near me. That's the type of intense emotion that Jesus is experiencing here when he's coming down the Mount of Olives and he sees Jerusalem and it says that he klaufmas, et klaufmas, actually, bewailed, sobbed audibly in the midst of the praises of man. Ten thousands upon ten thousands of voices, Jesus weeps. An important point to make here is that when we see Jesus do something, it tells us something about God the Father. 
The Bible tells us in John chapter 14, verse 9, there's an interaction there that Jesus has with Philip. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you, with you so long that you don't know? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God. And he is his radiance. So when we see Jesus, we see the invisible God. When we see Jesus experiencing emotions and feelings, we see how God the Father experiences things. These people who were going to be destroyed because of their rejection of Christ, Jesus wails and mourns because of them. See, friends, God is not cold or calloused when it comes to the destruction of the wicked. He takes no delight in the destruction of the wicked. They are still destroyed. They are still destroyed. But God takes no delight in it. Friend, if you sit there in this pew and you are walking in rejection of Christ, understand that God mourns over you. He loves you so much that he sees you as a mother or a father who has lost their child in a disaster. He longs for you to come back in faith. He longs for you to surrender to Jesus and be the recipient of grace and mercy and peace. Friend, God loves you so much. Jesus loves the city of Jerusalem and he loves his own people so much so that he weeps. Look at verse 42. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, this is his explanation, would that you, even you, he intensifies it here, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Would that you, even you, knew the things that would make for peace. What did they think would make for peace? They thought that having the king come into Jerusalem and overthrow the oppression of the Romans would bring them peace. Their peace was so temporal, what they're looking for. Their peace was so earthly that they're looking for. But that's not the things that make for peace. The things that make for peace is what Jesus is going to do in Jerusalem. Jesus was not concerned with bringing peace among men at that point. Jesus was concerned with bringing peace between man and God, between reconciling man and God because of the sin of man and the enmity of God against man, the wrath of God against man. And for all of his sins, Jesus is going to go on the in-between and he is going to absorb the wrath of God. Be the propitiation, the halasmas for our sins. He will absorb all of that enmity from God for the things that we have done wrong. And they completely missed that point. Completely missed that point. What they want is a king to come and overthrow Rome. But they were serving so much of a greater master than Rome. They were serving their sin. They didn't need to be freed from Rome. They needed to be freed from their sin. They needed to be freed from God to love God. That's the things that make for peace. Christian, are you consumed with the things that make for peace? Because we better be very, very careful here. Because the Jews, they worship Jesus on the way into Jerusalem, not for what he was going to do, but for what they thought he was going to do. They wanted peace on earth. They wanted political dominance. And the thing that I hear so much today, even from the church, from quote-unquote evangelical Christians, is that they want the church to have some sort of political dominance in this world. But that is not the thing that makes for peace. So many people, we are consumed, unholy, consumed, 
with this presidential election and this race. And we go home, we listen to the radio, we watch TV, we read articles on the internet, and we try to answer these questions. Who's going to fix Medicare? Who's going to fix Medicaid? Who's going to impl implement all the conservative principles? Who's going to balance the budget? Who's going to deal with immigration? Who is going to save this country? Because we are losing this country. And we talk about this election and about a president, about a king over us in the sense that people think that there will be some sort of salvation that is going to come through a man. But I'm here to tell you there is no salvation that will come through any person on this planet if you elect them as president. There is zero salvation because you could elect the finest man or woman to the highest office in this country and they will not save the souls of men. The only thing that will save people is the thing that makes for peace. That is the gospel. When people turn to Jesus in faith and repentance because friends, if this country gets back on the right tracks, please understand this world will still burn in judgment from God. This country will not endure for eternity. No leader in this country will endure for eternity. Your faith in Christ is the only thing that matters. That is what makes for peace. That's it. Are we consumed with that which makes for peace? Or do we fight for religious freedom and prayer in schools as if that's the bastion of our faith? Friends, they can give us prayer back in the schools. They can give us freedom of religion, freedom to practice in the public square. They can recognize that constitutional right, whatever. But one day the Constitution will burn. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Are we consumed with that which makes for peace? I love Christmas. And at Christmas, we use this text so often. Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, a precious text. Well, in fact, we'll sing it eventually. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Interesting caveat there, huh? And peace on earth among those with whom he is pleased. Which the contrapositive of that is there are people on the earth with whom God is not pleased. And with the people whom God is not pleased, there is no peace. Friends, let get, let's get busy with the things that make for peace sharing the gospel with people because there are people not at peace with God. There are people who will receive the penalty for their sins and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through who? Through Jesus Christ our Lord, through the one who makes for peace, the one who died there in Jerusalem and was raised the third day. Folks, what the world needs is not the church to be politically dominant. What the world needs is Jesus. That's what they need. Amen. With every sin that we commit, outside of the grace of, of Christ, every sin that is committed in this world has both temporal consequences, that's right now earthly consequences, and it has eternal consequences. Jesus is going to enumerate in verse 30, 43 and 44 the temporal, the immediate consequences of the sin of the Jews here as they rejected their Christ. Look at 43. For the days will come upon you, and he's weeping as he's saying this. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you. Within 40 years of Jesus uttering that, that very event took place. 
In 70 AD, Titus Flavius, the emperor of Rome, marched on Jerusalem. And the first thing he did was what Jesus prophesied. He set up a barricade around them. He set up a barricade of sticks. That's what the word means there, insinuates. He set up a barricade of sticks. And the Jews were fed up with it, and they burned it to the ground. So Titus won up them, and he set up a barricade of stone. They will not get out. And the idea of the barricade is this. Nobody goes in with supplies, and nobody comes out to get supplies. You stay in there until you've consumed everything in the fridge, and then you and your kids are starving to death. And you're so weak, you can't even uphold the city anymore. And then we're going to march in, and we're going to kill you in your weakness. We're going to take the city easily. So they set up a barricade. Finally, they just had enough of waiting. So they tore the barricade down. They leveled the city. They leveled the city walls as these legions, at least five legions of Roman soldiers, marched on Jerusalem, turning over the stones of the wall. And a soldier ran up to the temple, and he shoved a torch into the side of the wall. And they lit. Titus wasn't going to burn the temple down. But in the chaos, the temple starts burning down. So what they did was they just finished it off. Burn it to the ground, turned all the stones over, not one stone left upon one another. The Jews slaughtered there in Jerusalem. That was the temporal consequence of their rejection of Jesus. He handed them over to the nations just as he did time and time again. And the city is still trampled by Gentiles. Why did Jesus weep, sob, mourn, wail, bemoan the city? Why did he do that? You would think, possibly, that Jesus is mourning intensely because of the betrayal he's about to undergo. Judas, who's been walking with him for some three years now, is going to betray him, hand him over to the Romans, and they are going to beat him, flog him, drive a crown of thorns in his head, rip the flesh off his back, tear the skin off, pour wine and gall on his sores so they'll burn, wrap him in a cloak, rip it off, rip all the other skin off. And Jesus would be so mutilated there on the cross that people said you couldn't even recognize him as a man. You would think that Jesus' weeping and mourning and wailing had something to do with that. That's not what the text says. What does he say there at the end of 44? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus is mourning and weeping for those who are reigning in their own destruction. He's not mourning and weeping because of the betrayal and the intense suffering he's about to undergo. He is mourning and weeping because they missed their opportunity. They missed their Christ. If they'd have known the time of their visitation, Daniel chapter 9, in fact, prophesied it. Daniel 9, verse 24 through 37 is a prophecy to the day of when Jesus marched into Jerusalem and then was crucified. Daniel prophesies that 69 weeks, that after seven weeks, that's seven sets of seven years, plus 62 weeks, which is seven years each. So 69 sets of seven years, a lot of confusing math there, I know. 69 sets of seven years comes out to 483 years from the time of the decree that Artaxerxes said to rebuild Jerusalem. He gave that decree in 455 B.C., 483 years later, Jesus, to the day, was crucified there in Jerusalem. If they'd only read their Bible, they would have known the time of their visitation. When Jesus, as Zechariah 9 says, would ride into the city, their king, their Messiah, the anointed one would ride on the foal of a donkey. It'd be easy to see if you'd only read the Bible. But they missed it. They missed their opportunity to embrace the Christ, to embrace their King, and God mourned over them. Friend, there are people in this room this morning whom God has been visiting. He has been calling them, He's been calling you to follow after Him. And at this moment, 
this is the time that God visits you. You're not guaranteed another moment. Will you leave this place with a desolate soul and a desolate eternity? And will God mourn over you because you missed your opportunity? Or will you embrace that which makes for peace? Would you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know that you absorb the penalty for my sin. I deserve to die for my sin, but you stepped in my place, and I surrender my life to you and ask you to forgive me of my sins. Lord, I'll commit the rest of my life to you because that's what you say to do. If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow after me. Anyone who loses his life for my sake, he will find it. So you come to Jesus, and you don't miss that opportunity. Church, people who are walking with Jesus, maybe this morning we need to recalibrate our focus. That our focus would be on that which makes for peace. That our focus would be on the gospel. Not on setting up some earthly kingdom, because Jesus is coming back and all earthly kingdoms are going to topple. So let's focus on the gospel every moment of every day because time runs short. Can you pray with me?